Welcome back for this session. Really fascinating subject, what can broadcasters and regulators do to counter fake news? The chair for this session is Stuart Purvis. He already pretty well introduced himself in the previous session, so I'll just hand over to you, Stuart. Thanks very much indeed, Colin. Um, yes, news just in. A public information campaign to show people how they could be tricked by AI-powered misinformation should be run before the next election, says the government's chief scientific advisor, Professor Dame Angela McLean. She says the government are extremely worried about the risk of artificial intelligence tools posing and creating and spreading misinformation at the next general election, which could take place next year. But Dame Angela also says that the government is not doing enough about it. So, there's a subject which I think came up in a sense when uh, Dame Ellen Clough Stevens this morning talked about the fact, I think she said, what, the half the world is going to vote next year? But even before we get to next year, we have very, very current issues arising from the spread of uh, misinformation, uh, they almost call it a tide, on social media uh, because of the Israel-Hamas war. And the, the, of the issues which have come out of that, for me, is there a danger that this, this tide of untruths is actually finding its way somehow onto the broadcast media? Uh, is there a danger of the credibility of the excellent work, which I think everyone today has said is being done by British TV and radio journalists in the war zones, is that being undermined by fake news? Or, turning it on ahead, head, is this a moment for trusted public service broadcasting to show the difference from, if you like, untrusted social media? Now, under Ofcom's uh, broadcasting code, TV channels and radio stations have an obligation to provide due impartiality and due accuracy. Well, at the last VLV conference uh, we explored, we had an excellent session on due impartiality, and we saw the echoes of that uh, this morning in Lord Grade's remarks. Today we're going to turn really to this issue of due accuracy and what it means for broadcasters in a world where it's absolutely clear that artificial intelligence is, even, is making it even easier to make fakes. And I say even easier because we heard from Lord Grey that, uh, according to him, it started back in the Civil War that people were creating fakes in the forms of pamphlets. So let's accept that there's nothing entirely new about faking the news, but there is something new in technology which enables this to happen more often. Uh, our first speaker, that every, uh, each of our panels is going to do an opening turn and then we'll do a, a, a debate. Uh, Mariana Spring is the BBC's disinformation and social media correspondent, sometimes known as Miss Information. Um, one of her recent podcasts is Mariana in Conspiracy Land. She has a book coming out, Among the Trolls, Notes from the Disinformation War. It's out next March. And a recent Guardian profile said she spends her time pursuing trolls and dismantling conspiracy theories. In return, she is abused, slandered and threatened. Hopefully not here at the VLV, Mariana Spring. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, and thank you all for coming to this panel. Um, exactly as Stuart explained, um, I'm the BBC's first ever disinformation and social media correspondent, um, and that essentially means I spend a lot of my time investigating everything horrible on social media. Um, it's the first time that the BBC has ever had a role like this, um, and my focus is predominantly on the real-world consequences of hate, disinformation, algorithms, and how they affect the world around us. Um, and I think that's really important when we're answering this question of how did broadcasters counter disinformation or fake news. I think a lot of it is about the way that we do it. Um, I think you could endlessly spend your time um, fact-checking and dealing with all kinds of mistruths uh, and disinformation that are spreading on social media and beyond, um, but actually really focusing on the most harmful disinformation and the way that that can affect uh, people's lives and the real world is really important. I also think it's important because it it speaks to and connects with an audience which, uh, who, who are not perhaps traditionally as interested in um, fact-checking or open-source investigative techniques, but it really connects with them. Um, so uh, you mentioned the Mariana in Conspiracy Land podcast series that I did uh, this year that was investigating um, how extreme uh, and hateful some members of the UK conspiracy theory movement have become. Um, and um, I go from Totnes to Manchester to uh, Germany to figure out more about the connections this movement has, and I focus on a conspiracy 
conspiracy theory newspaper. Um, that was a podcast that performed, um, uh, it was one of the most listened to podcasts on BBC Sounds, storytelling podcasts, and it performed particularly well with under 35s. Um, I think because that style of investigating this topic, where you are entering a world and you're taking the audience with you and you say, right, I'm not sitting in my ivory tower, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to get up close with the people who believe this stuff, the people who are harmed and affected by it. Um, I think that that's really crucial when we think about the ways of connecting with different audiences. Um, in a similar way, I did another investigation for BBC Three called uh, The TikTok Effect, and it was about investigating the way that TikTok's algorithm um, is driving... Uh, uh, is driving disproportionate amounts of engagement to certain topics, and that's then connected to harmful behaviour offline. You might think of the Nicola Bully case, um, which uh, happened earlier this year. Um, uh, she went missing in St Michael's on Wire, and there was this frenzy uh, on TikTok and beyond. Um, and a lot of that also speaks to your point about the interaction between the media and social media, and the way that the media can perhaps sometimes um, also chase the same views and likes that are really accumulating on TikTok. And it has a real world effect. It's really harmful for the people who are at the centre of these cases and often living through the very worst things. Um, when it comes to Israel and Gaza, um, again, as you say, there's been this wave of disinformation and uh, uh, hate and all kinds of harmful content on social media. It raises big questions for the social media companies and a lot of my job is about holding those social media companies to account for the real world harm that this can do. Um, I think that Again, you could spend a lot of time endlessly poring over different stories, and I'm, I'm part of a team at the BBC called BBC Verify, which um, has a whole range of different expertise in terms of open source investigative techniques, in terms of fact-checking, and then also the kind of um, investigative reporting that I do. Um, and uh, there was a story I did, um, which was a really sad story, about two little boys uh, who were both four years old, one Palestinian, one Israeli. They were both killed... Um, uh, they, both, they were both killed since the 7th of October, um, one when uh, Hamas attacked um, one of the little boys' kibbutz uh, where he was living, and then the other um, during an Israeli airstrike. Um, and both of their deaths were denied in really quite extreme ways on social media. And so that was a very powerful way of humanising the impact that disinformation can have, not only on the family, um, the family and friends who I tracked down um, who are, not, are grieving um, someone that they've lost, but then also... Um, the wider implications this has for how disinformation plays out around wars and conflicts and battles, particularly because very often it seeks to undermine the most shocking examples of violence um, against civilians, um, which um, you know either side often have an interest in, in downplaying or undermining in some way. Um, so that's a kind of upshot of, of what I do, um, and um, I find that all of this content is particularly high-performing with young, young listeners and readers and viewers. Um, a lot of my investigations are inspired by the audience members that get in touch with me they'll say can you go out and investigate this can you go out and look at this and that that often is a trigger for me saying all right let me go and 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 have a look and I think that's really important the way that we are on the same level as the audience and we are out there investigating for them and with them um, to uncover what's going on. Um, and when it comes to AI, which I imagine is something that people might also be interested in talking about, I completely agree that we need to think a lot about the impact that AI can have, particularly on the spread of disinformation and hate, um, and that's something I'm investigating at the moment. But it's also important to remember right now that algorithms are AI. There's lots of harm connected to AI that's occurring right now and for which they're, it's very hard to hold the social media companies to account. They very rarely will do an interviews um, and um, I think that's something that we have to think about and also quite simple tactics still succeed in spreading very harmful disinformation. Conspiracy Land was about a conspiracy theory newspaper um, so you know we don't have to look to AI there are still quite simple ways of um, causing very serious harm with uh, not AI. So yeah thank you. Thank you Marilla. OK, and now Chris Morris. Now, Chris is a fact checker. In fact, he's the chief executive of Full Fact, which is a registered charity which is funded by lots of individual donors, by charitable foundations, and contracts with platforms who basically ask Full Fact to fact check what's on their platforms. I've been particularly interested to hear uh, how that works. Uh, and you've got, I think, I think you say, Chris, got cross-party supporters, so it's not associated with any one political group. You fight bad information in different ways, fact-checking claims, developing technology to help, and campaigning for changes in the law. So, Chris, let's hear from you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stuart. Um, I think I'd like to address, actually, in the, in the few minutes I have here, the challenge you kind of gave us about accuracy. Um, and I guess I'd, I'd look at it from the, from the view of a relatively small charity like Full Fact, but I think a lot of the con conclusions I would draw 
are kind of similar for major broadcasters, but just on a bigger scale. Um, I've only been with Full Fact, full disclosure, for about six weeks. For a long time, I've worked with Mariana at the BBC. I was a correspondent there for 25 years abroad and then um, running BBC Reality Check. But I guess when Full Fact was founded in 2009, the question it was set up to ponder was, is this person telling me the truth? Or why is this person lying to me? Audience members of a certain age may remember Jeremy Paxman had a slightly fruitier version of that question. <laughs> but the point is the limits with which we were trying to test and convey accuracy were pretty strictly defined. Um, the question has changed, uh, and it's changed radically. And I think the question we're struggling to answer now uh, for all kind of audiences across the country and across the world is, can I believe anything I read or hear or see anywhere? So the playing field has got a lot bigger. Now, obviously, social media has kind of helped bring that rather existential question to prominence. And then artificial intelligence has accelerated it. Generative AI has done even more to accelerate it. It's democratised the creation of misinformation to such an extent. It's made it so quick that pretty much anyone can do it at any time. I mean, if this was, I don't know, misinformation Star Trek, we'd be going into warp speed. I, I think you have to really sort of hold on to the sides of your chairs to realise how quickly things are going to change in the next couple of years. I think it's pretty likely that within the next couple of years the vast majority of new information being generated will be generated by artificial intelligence. And that brings big questions with it. So what can we do about that? I mean, the audiences are really confused. Our audiences are really confused. Certainly the audiences of big broadcasters are. And I think before we get to the specifics of, of accuracy, that means we have to talk about trust. Because trust in the fact that we're trying to be accurate has drained away, authority has drained away. And, and that's the world in which anyone trying to put out what we would consider to be good content is having to operate. Um, there are all sorts of ways in which I think you can try and generate trust, but let me just mention a few of them. One of them, obviously, is to show our working. So when we produce any fact check, for example, we will set out very clearly where all the information has come from. In the written version of the fact check, there will be links so in other words, when people ask the question, who fact-checks the fact-checkers, the answer is everybody does, because we've, we've set out the places that we have got the information from which we've drawn our conclusions. Uh, and I think that's really important, because the days of, if you like, handing down news like tablets of stone from the mountain, those days are gone. We have to engage, as Mariana said, in, in, in as many ways as we can with the audience, and we have to win the trust that they believe we're doing our best to be accurate. Um, it's, no, it's no accident, I, I think, that um, Mariana mentioned BBC Verify. I, mean, I used to work for BBC Reality Check, which has been sort of subsumed into BBC Verify. But the not-so-subtle kind of message of BBC Verify is, we verified it, you can trust us, it is accurate. That's what that message, and that's why every time you turn on the telly now, you'll hear some journalists saying, well, v BBC Verify tells us this, because they are trying to persuade us that what we're doing here is accurate in a sea of misinformation, and it's a really difficult thing to do. So, you know, it is partly about the obvious things, good journalism, good explanation, good storytelling, all the things that media organisations have always tried to do if uh, they, if they are, want to be considered good, good media organisations. But I think another really important way to... to gain trust in the accuracy of what we're doing is to admit mistakes when we make them and correct mistakes. And that's a big thing for us at Full Fact. We make no apology for campaigning hard for people to be honest and accurate, and that should apply to the media and it should apply to politicians as well. And our ask is pretty simple. If you make a mistake, own up to it, correct it, and we can all move on. As I said, I haven't been at Full Fact for all that long, but it's interesting to me that the media, in many ways, has been more open to that message than many politicians. I mean, it was full fact work, for example, uh, that um, enabled correction columns to appear in both The Sun and The Daily Mail. This was a few years ago now. But it, I'm, I'm slightly baffled by the number of politicians. Some are very good, but others really struggle with the idea that they may have got something wrong. 
and they think that admitting it is a weakness. So our argument is, look, admitting your mistakes is a strength, not a weakness, because it increases trust, and it, when you increase trust, you can promote accuracy. Um, I think it's also important to remember that, you know, technology can be used to spread good information as well as bad information. I think that's really important to remember, that in, in every technological revolution, there are fears that Armageddon is coming, and most technological revolutions have improved the course of human history. So at Full Fact, for example, we're developing or have developed automated fact-checking tools, which mean that pretty close now to real time, we can transcribe, monitor, and use a large language model to recognize patterns of language, the patterns in which claims are made, repeat patterns of language, test those claims against a database of fact checks we've already done, and come up in quite a complex, fast-moving environment with something that will say, we don't believe this is accurate. So the machines can do a huge amount of the background slog to then allow a human to add the context and the caveat which is necessary for good, good journalism. We'll certainly be using that in the next UK election, but thanks to generous funders, it's also being rolled out as a technology uh, in elections across Africa. So in Nigeria this year, uh, in um, the Democratic, Democratic Republic of Congo next month, in Liberia, in Senegal, in South Africa, hopefully in India next year as well. So I think it's really important to remember that technology can help us to promote and defend accuracy. There's no question that we are, fight, we are swimming against the tide at the moment. As I said, I think so much bad information is going to be generated uh, by artificial intelligence and particularly by generative artificial intelligence that there is a danger that if we don't stand up and fight against it, we will kind of get blown away. And I think that the, the real danger is if you get to a stage where nobody believes anything they can read, write or hear, the question I posed at the beginning, then you have to think, well, what's left of liberal democracy? And that's why I think that this is a fight worth having. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. And now to another Chris. Chris Bannett Vala uh, is an independent media consultant. He was, uh, some years ago, a producer on Channel 4 News. Uh, he then joined, I think, the ITC in its final stages, uh, and then uh, moved across to Ofcom, where I worked with him when he was the director of standards. And he's now, when I get a phone call from somebody, a broadcaster, who says, I think I'm in trouble with the rules. What do I do? I always say, ring Chris Bannett of Arla, <laughs> And he'll, he'll do the right thing. He'll do the right thing. So Chris is going to talk particularly from the experience of working with broadcasters on these issues. Thank you, Chris. Hi. So I've obviously got the regulatory or graveyard uh, slot here. Um, it is, of course... Um, important for both broadcasters and the regulator to get this right. So in true regulatory fashion, I'm just going to define what I think fake news is. It's misinformation that is designed to deceive. It's not something that a politician disagrees with, and it's not an opinion which somebody disagrees with or a disputed fact. It's not genuine mistakes made by broadcasters and publishers. There have been many times over the years that mainstream news providers have put out egregious examples of mistakes, fake videos and uh, false news, but these were mistakes. These are mean, may have even been careless mistakes, but they weren't fake news. But with the extraordinary explosion in AI, <coughs> it's really difficult to spot fake news. But we are getting to a stage which Chris has said that can we believe everything that we see, we hear, or we read? This really is an existential threat. So how do we know who to trust and what role does regulation have in this? What we have to understand is that whatever the industry is, regulation is always behind the curve. Technology and innovation happens so quickly at such a pace that legislation takes time to catch up. It can be five years from a green paper to an act which tries to solve the problem. This year's media bill is the first major piece of media regulation and legislation for 20 years. And compared to the Communications Act, it's a tiny, thin document, and it doesn't even touch on fake news or AI or a lot of the details and regulation that broadcasters and new video-on-demand platforms deal with. So how does Ofcom need to deal with this? Ofcom is a creature of statute. It only legislates 
It, sorry, it only regulates what legislation says it should do. So does it have the legal powers to combat fake news? In a page and a half note published earlier this year, Ofcom says it's confidence, confident that the Broadcasting Code can cope with these issues. Of course, the principles of accuracy, impartiality, misleading material and fairness apply all the time. And in future, they are going to now apply to video on demand. But my question is, does Ofcom have the skill set necessary to deal with this new world of AI and fake news? How will it apply its powers proportionally? What is a fair response when the fakery is so sophisticated that anyone can get fooled, including the regulator itself? And can Ofcom be, or any organisation, really be the holder or arbiter of truth? But we can't look at accuracy in isolation. There is a connection with impartiality. There is a danger that accuracy suffers as Ofcom and broadcasters seek impartiality. False equivalence can result in a veneer of respectability for fake news and conspiracy theorists. And opinion news, if that's what it is, is not checked as vigorously as bulletins and current affairs programmes. But despite what's occurring in the world of misinformation, the legislation and the regulator only requires news to be duly accurate. No other content needs to be accurate. In fact, Ofcom had to specifically develop a rule around misleading material to capture other types of mischief and potentially harmful content because it didn't appear directly in the legislation. But it is becoming increasingly difficult for broadcasters and regulators to assess accuracy. First, because there are so many challenges to statements of fact. Second, because developments like AI make it increasingly difficult to judge whether something is true. So the question is, do broadcasters and regulators have the skills to deal with AI and sophisticated fake news? And if they do, how are they going to cut through the noise? Broadcasters must make decisions quickly. Verification is essential. They are competing with many other platforms. Competition can result in mistakes. It's much easier to be a regulator. Judging accuracy with all the facts in front of you, you've got time to gather it, and you have all the time in the world. But sometimes these judgments come just too late, and the damage has already been done. But in the end, with all of this and the discussions about broadcasters and fake news, we can't forget social media. Ofcom doesn't and never will regulate accuracy there. Thank you, Chris. Uh, to pick up on some of the issues that come up, Marianne, let me come to you first. Uh, Chris made an interesting point, which I hadn't quite picked up before, that the previous strand, which was called... Reality, Re Reality Check. Check. Reality yeah. Check was a way of saying, we've looked at that and we don't, we don't think that's right. BBC Verify is going a step beyond and saying, we believe this is right or this, this video is, is accurate. Doesn't that put the BBC in particular, in even more of a kind of spotlight for the, if you like, let's call them the bad guys on social media. And is that partly responsible why you individually get, get picked out, if you like, as a symbol of the BBC telling people what the truth is? Yeah, so I think that um, the, it's interesting to kind of think about how BBC Verify, uh, who it's made up of. Um, so as Chris mentioned, Reality Check is now sort of a part of BBC Verify, as well as teams that work in open source investigative techniques. So their job is um, looking at satellite imagery, video, and really piecing together what we know about what's happening on the ground, especially in hard to reach places. So for example, Gaza at the moment. Um, and then you've also got people who work specifically in analysis. So Ros Atkins, who um, is also in, this, in the team, with me, the analysis editor. And then you've got what I do, which is much more sort of social media and disinformation investigations. There is, a, at times, uh, uh, attempts to sort of misunderstand what my job actually is, um, which I face quite a lot, particularly if you look at my feed on X. It's almost like I'm the BBC complaints person sometimes. <laughs> um, but um, I think what's important is exactly what you say, that um, I think BBC Verify is a, is, is a bold and brave way of really um, uh, investigating 
um, d disinformation and uh, mistruths and everything else, uh, both on social media and beyond, and piecing together um, as much as we know about what's going on. I think that's really important. But at the same time, that makes us a lightning rod for all kinds of hate, criticism, otherwise. I think for me, a lot of the reason... Um, you know, a lot of the trolling and the hate I experience, I think is directly a product of kind of my willingness to enter these worlds and to get up close with them. I could sit back and do stuff that's a bit more boring that audiences wouldn't engage with as much, which would be um, less good for the audiences. And I'd probably get less hate and less trolling. So I think that, um, you know, everything that makes what I do, I hope, something that the audience really love and, you know, really popular, particularly with audiences that we struggle to reach, is the very same thing that makes me a lightning rod for this stuff. And I'm not willing to compromise the kind of audience to protect myself from the hate. So that's kind of the cost of it. Um, but I think increasingly, and there's a wider point to make here, which is that um, online abuse and hate is, is, is a weapon deployed to undermine trust in journalists. Um, and it's a way of, um, uh, it, it's, it's very, I think it's really important that we, and it's why I talk about it a lot, it's a, it's a tactic. And so I cover disinformation and hate. So I have to expose how that tactic works. And in some ways, I become a bit of a case study in that story. Um, if audiences can understand how that works and how people try and target and undermine those who are, you know, doing investigative journalism or trying to tell them what's going on, I think that's, I think that's really important. Um, and it does pose a... I think it's something that we should all take really seriously. And, you know, I'm by no means... I, I experience a very unique type of hate because of what I cover, but there are all kinds of journalists who experience a range of different types of hate. Um, and journalists, for example, like the BBC's Persian service, who've been sort of ruthlessly targeted. Um, so I think it's really important that we look more broadly at how online hate is used to kind of undermine trust in journalists and it's a way of conspiracy influencers and um, actors um, uh, pushing their own message kind of at the detriment of the truth often. Right. Well, can I just say you're, you're, can I just say you're standing it up up to it very well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just saying the, worth, the one thing that's worth adding to that is you could call it what you like, BBC Verify. You could rebrand as BBC Pink Elephant, and it would still be laid into from all sides. It's just sort of part of the territory. Right. But with your uh, sort of different perspective, having been a, a, a broadcaster and now sort of standing back from it a little bit, is there an, is there a conscious attempt to undermine public service broadcasting in this, or is it just they, they like picking on the BBC because everyone's heard of the BBC? Um, I think uh, there are certainly actors out there who want to undermine public service broadcasting. There's no question about that. Um, and some of it's for, for political reasons and some of it's for commercial reasons. I mean, if you look at the way the most modern sort of iterations of televisions work, public service broadcasting, when you go to the menu, is hidden away somewhere. In the, and if you get a Samsung television, the thing that will be promoted to you most is Samsung TV mm. because you now have internet protocol television, which doesn't rely on any television signal. It just comes through the internet. And so the people who make the televisions can then promote their own television channels, and they can advertise stuff to you on their own television channels, which bring you back to their products again. So, um, so yes, there are people who want to undermine public service broadcasting because it's free at the point of use and it's for the public good, and they want to make money out of it or, or create political influence. OK, let's move on to this issue of elections. And, uh, and David Lloyd, I think, was a question earlier. David's not able to with us, so called him from Zoom. Somebody you know, Chris. <laughs> um, it's, this is a, a real David Lloyd question. So um, that to you. <laughs> it, <laughs> would you agree with me uh, that in the coming election, the air war is likely to be brutal with unsourced fake news to the fore, often from outside the UK? Do you think that the combined defences of the Electoral Commission, the Information Commissioner, and even Ofcom, who are post hoc regulators rather than investigators, will be sufficient to protect our democracy, or do you have any other possible systemic protections in mind? Chris, particularly in elections, because I suppose because, again, we're slightly influenced by this issue about impartiality in broadcast news, and we look forward to an election, and we think, how is any of this going to work in an election? You've sat on the elections yeah. committee at Ofcom, which does work a little bit quicker than the normal it does. machine. It does. But, uh, I mean, given the scale of what we talked about, can you see Ofcom being able to, to manage, or anyone else, the Electoral Commission, manage what we think is going to happen during the election campaign? Well, I think the answer to that question is no and no, really, to be honest with you, because yeah. I think things are just happening so fast. And I think, um, you're right, Ofcom does work much quicker in an election period. I think to gain the trust of the public and the electorate is actually down to the broadcaster as well for the, the regulator. And that's not to say that the regulator uh, has to step back, etc. But basically, the damage is done once it's been broadcast. And that's why places you know, like the BBC Verify are so important. And actually, the only way that broadcasters and media providers are going to be able to win this war is through trust. 
Now, it's really difficult because you've got this, this, this tsunami of misinformation about, and there are a lot of people who, by definition, do not believe in ITN or Sky or BBC who will be sucked into the other misinformation, and they're fighting a war. But it's not a war that Ofcom or the broadcasters can win. The only way that they can do it is to fight it and to try and convince people through brands and through the information, through the sort of work that's done to show your workings. But I'm afraid there is, and I, I, I don't have an answer to this yet, that there is a sort of lost uh, uh, segment of society who will not believe anything, irrespective of the facts they're told. We've seen it ha happen in America, and it's sort of happening in the UK. I always think the UK follows America, but never quite goes quite so far. Mm. And it sort of pulls itself back from the brink sometimes. Um, uh, so so I, I think it's really difficult. Uh, Maria, you appear on the uh, AmeriCast podcast where you, it's a bit complicated explaining, maybe it's not the time to do it, but you do an intriguing way of showing what an average American gets in their social media feeds. I, I always think after, the, after, I think it was over the Brexit uh, referendum, a number of broadcasters said, all this stuff that everyone's talking about, I never saw any of it because it was all on social media and I don't use social media. In other words, the broadcasters are sort of in a sort of, uh, were then certainly in a sort of hermetically sealed zone and somehow all this material which was flooding across, they weren't aware of. But in, the, in America, it's almost the roles almost <coughs> reversed, haven't they? The people are seeing more stuff on social media than they're seeing on broadcast news. And what conclusions have you drawn from that? Yeah, actually, when, when you asked that question initially, it was the first thing I was thinking of, because yeah. um, so the undercover voters for people that don't listen to AmeriCast are basically five characters um, that are based on data from a US think tank, and they have social media profiles across all of the main sites. And they allow me to interrogate what some US voters are being recommended on their feeds. Um, they're not an exhaustive insight into what everyone's seeing, but they do give you a sense of, of what's appearing and the different ways that different voters can view different events. Um, and I think that's really important because increasingly everyone, everyone in this room will have um, their own their own kind of social media feeds that are unique to them in many ways. And um, it's really, really hard as journalists for us to know what different people are being recommended and seeing. The social media companies are not transparent about what they're recommending or what they're targeting people with. And so I think that these kinds of undercover accounts, which are obviously run in a um, totally in line with the BBC's editorial standards, but that are, you know, passive accounts that just allow you to see what to feed an algorithm and to see what you're recommended are essential and actually you know thinking ahead to next year where you know we'll, we likely will have the UK and the US elections and that's absolutely something that we're kind of planning to build on at the BBC so that we're able to get into those kinds of spaces and to see what different UK and US voters are being recommended or targeted with because there's no real other way of doing that and that's really dangerous and and if you look at what's going on around um, uh, the, the war um, the Israel kind of Hamas war the way that that's unfolding, uh, there, there are big questions about polarisation and how people are being pushed increasingly towards divisive content that confirms their own biases and they're much more inclined to believe disinformation or hateful content or to spread hateful content because it fits with what they believe and they want to believe it. Um, and so, yeah, I think as a public service broadcaster and certainly in my role, it's crucial that we're in those spaces. It would be like saying to, you know, Chris Mason, oh, you can't go inside Parliament. It's like, you have to, I have to go inside the social media feeds. I can't, I can't not. But I think one issue arises, and I think both Chris's may have a view on this, I think, I think it's actually Channel 4 that first went into fact-checking, but it was always pretty much online. And then the reality check on BBC was pretty much always online. And then I think it was possibly after Brexit that you would appear giving uh, yeah. the view. And I've, I've often, I mean, I've actually challenged colleagues in BBC and said, why don't I see people appearing on the 10 o'clock news or the 6 o'clock news calling out a political party or calling out somebody associated with a political party. Is there a reluctance amongst broadcasters to, see, to be seen to be calling out these fake news? I, I don't think there is. I mean, I think one of the problems is if you take the 10 o'clock news, once you've stripped out the headlines and the weather, you're basically talking 22 minutes mm. to talk about the whole world. Yeah. And so if you have a political piece which is already four minutes long, then doing a fact check off the back of that is just too much of the bulletin, unfortunately. Um, it's easier, there's more space on the website. I mean, I quite often did do fact checks, but, but certainly there was demand for more. I used to get furious emails from people almost every morning saying, why aren't you fact checking X on the Today programme mm. as he says it? He's lying, he said this, he said that. Why isn't the presenter uh, um, calling him out for the lies? And a lot of that's opinion. Yeah. Some, some of it is fact, some of it is opinion. And there was that very specific period of very, very 
bitter partisan politics in the UK post-Brexit 2017 to 2020, roughly, yeah. when I think opinion almost... I mean, facts disappeared, but opinions became quite damaging as well. And certainly in America, we had extraordinary period, really, in, in the last election, where there were networks, and it was pretty much one side was Fox and the other side was CNN, who were fact-checking live something we'd never, I'd never seen it before. So, you know, Trump would say something and the capture would come up, not true, something like that. Now, we've, we've never got into that. But again, Chris, from your, from your experience, both as a politics mm. producer and in your, in your other life, have you found broadcasters a little bit reluctant to get the, into this? I think broadcasters are very reluctant to use the word lie. Yeah, we, yeah, we know yeah. that, despite, I think, what Dorothy Byrne wanted, wanted yeah. Channel 4 News to do. They, they really what, are... What, you mean when she called Boris Johnson a liar? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But, so I think there is that, but sort of going to that, sometimes facts and figures do become inverted commas opinions because there's a debate about how that figure was, was, was arised at. And a classic example is obviously the £350 million uh, claim on the bus. Now that became very, very controversial. And to be fair to the broadcasters, Tom Bradby in particular on ITN, yeah. challenged over and over again this figure. And yet, the, uh, the, 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 the pro-Brexit uh, people were explaining, well, it, you know, it doesn't include the rebate, but it's still a valid figure. And this went around and around. It was, it was challenged. But people believe what they want to believe. And this is what is so difficult about trying to get the, the truth or whatever the, the actual facts out there, is that people will take away what they want. And so even if the broadcasters and the BBC and Channel 4 and ITV they, and Sky, they all did this, they all challenged the 350. It didn't cut through. Everyone said, oh, they didn't. Because, and I do think that politicians also have to play their part in this. They know particularly well, well when they're being disingenuous, when they're being Thank interviewed. You, yeah. And I think it's, it's not... It's, it, there, there is a contract here between uh, those people who make policy and politicians and broadcasters to fundamentally tell the truth. I, and I, I think, think there's a problem here. Yeah. I think that's really important. It's one of the things Full Facts is campaigning for. At the next election, the lead for accuracy has to come from politicians because with public office comes public responsibility. And if they don't do it, it's very difficult for anyone else to follow suit. And I think AI and, 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 and the way that AI could be, could be misused by the political parties, and I know there are attempts underway at the moment to get all the political parties to, to have some sort of public pledge about how they will use AI in the next election, is absolutely critical. Because in a, in a bad situation, which is I suspect what we're going to see in the United States next year, uh, it could get very, very ugly. I, uh, I just give one more example, which I think is interesting, which would be interesting to know how you two dealt with this, was the AI or the, the, the mis... Actually, it wasn't AI. It was the mis-editing of, I think it was Keir Starmer um, making a comment that they'd taken something out. He was laughing. It was, I can't quite remember it. And the politicians on the Today programme were, the, the, were, were unable to say that this was misleading. Um, and it, it grew into a huge argument. And again, it, it, it's, it's, it's the broadcasters as well as the politicians on all sides who need to be sort of much more open and... Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to challenge Michael Grade's sort of World War II uh, analogies, but I do remember the last Brexit referendum, if we should go back to the 70s, yes. I, I did a piece, I interviewed Peter Shaw, who was, who was Labour yeah. anti-common market, as it was called, and he said something in the interview, and I went away and checked it, and it wasn't true, so I rang him up and said, so Mr Shaw, there's been some sort of standing, so, and I said, it's not true, he said, oh, well, not to bother. And I thought, well, if that's is that how careless you are with the truth, mm. I mean, and, and yet he was shameless about the fact that he, he pretty much accepted it. And it had always been untrue. Now, look, we've got we we our time was curtailed slightly because of, uh, of the awards, but uh, since I was collecting one of them, I can't complain about yeah. that. Um, <laughs> should we have now some questions, uh, gentleman there, and then the lady behind? Yes, go, ahead, gentleman, with the scarf. Yes, yeah, they're very interesting, and uh, sure. very much respect for what you're doing. And interestingly, everybody on the panel has mm. the last few minutes said. It's not only a question of facts, it's also mm. very much a question of opinions. Mm. Those seem to me to be different things. And we all have, to some extent, predetermined views. And we all want Should take to, the mic. Yeah. We all want, uh, I'm talking about predetermined opinions. Not me, because I only observe facts and I'm sure. logical. <laughs> but everybody else in the room, you've got an opinion about leaving Europe or about migration or about um, the changing climate and the causes of it. And we all tend, if we do go to social media, <clears throat> to look for the things that reinforce the opinions we probably have from childhood and parents and schools. Um, and we okay. <clears throat> look at the other ones which say that something the opposite is true. And we say, oh, bollock, rubbish, terrible. How could anybody say something like that? How do people doing what 
you guys are doing, which I greatly respect, check out not just facts, but opinions about things that could be reinforced or underplayed by social media at a time like this? I, 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 mean, first, I, I think, I mean, you're right, they are different things. And I think, I mean, certainly from a full fact perspective, uh, we are sort of robustly pro-free speech. And, you know, elections and politics absolutely should be about opinions and people arguing about opinions. And our, our, but, our, but our argument is that, that, that those opinions and those, that those differences of opinions should be based on, on an evidential base which stands up to statistical scrutiny. That's where the facts come from. You can interpret the facts in different ways, but if you can't even agree what the facts are which are underpinning your argument, that's when you have a problem. So I think, I think there are clear differences, and there, and there is some criticism of fact-checking, particularly in the United States, where I think it's become more partisan, that, um, if you like, fact-checkers are trying to shut down debate by telling people what to think. We're not telling anyone what to think. We're just saying that every voter deserves access to good information. And when you have political debate, make sure you, you debate the facts, not your version of the facts which don't stand up to the statistical scrutiny. OK, OK. Should we try another question? <laughs> Thank you. Catherine Johnson from the University of Leeds. Um, excellent panel. Um, Mariana, I really love your work. And you also uh, raised a really interesting point about the relationship between uh, traditional media and social media. And so I wondered for you, but also for the rest of the panel, what should the role of public service broadcasters be on social media in terms of their presence on social media, the kind of content they should be producing and putting on post social media? And does there need to be um, a, a change in regulation or policy to support um, the, the role that public service broadcasters could play on social media. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I'm just trying to think of, think of what I would say. Um, I think that um, I think there are kind of two, two different things there. I think the first is that um, it, it is really important, and kind of part of my job is this understanding the relationship between misinformation that spreads on social media and the real world harm that can cause, and then the way that interacts with the media or the way it's kind of picked up and that ecosystem and how it works. And so I think it's important to kind of investigate that quite directly. Um, I think more broadly, it's incredibly important important that the journalism that the BBC does or the other um, organisations, um, uh, Full Fact, public service broadcasters, the work they do is in the spaces that people inhabit. And I think that particularly applies for younger audiences. But actually, loads of people turn to social media for updates about what's going on. And I think a lot of it is also... Um, packaging it up in a way, telling it in a way that appeals to them and that, that really um, that really works. So something I've found um, when I look at kind of... Tick, so when I do any report, I'll do it for everyone. I'll do it for podcasts and the news at 10 and, and um, uh, maybe it'll be a panorama and then it's also online and it's for social. And we really think about the style of that. So often it will be... It will feel very native to people that use TikTok, for example. So it's just me talking to camera. And it actually speaks to that point about showing our workings. Um, I, on social media in particular... Um, I find that the audience respond very positively to that kind of come with me, let me show you how I investigated this and let me talk to you as you, you know, as other people that are on your feed would be talking to you. Um, so I think it's really, really important that public service broadcasters do have dedicated kind of teams that are looking at the way, the kinds of content they're creating and how it performs um, and that they are in that space. That is quite difficult when, when we think about something like uh, like X, for example. Uh, so I've, I've spent quite a lot of this year investigating the changes at Twitter, which is now called X, and the kind of real world consequences of that. Um, it's quite hard when there is a kind of when, when uh, broadcasters and journalists are kind of under attack on social media as well, and some of that kind of discourse can then undermine trust. Um, but I don't think that should be a reason for leaving those spaces. And I'm quite passionate about, in the same way that, you know, I, I wouldn't, when I first started getting online abuse, occasionally people would say to me, oh, do I just don't look at it or just log off. Um, but when you investigate social media, that's actually quite hard because that is um, where I need to spend most of my time. So I think that it's important that, um, that, that, broadcasters and journalists continue to exist and, and you know, fact-checking organisations and everyone else continue to exist in these spaces because it's where a lot of people are figuring out what's going on. But can I just say, is, is the BBC on what we might call more controversial platforms like Telegram or tr Truth Social? Um, so we're on the kind of biggest platforms. So, I mean, I, I, the, the social media team would know even more about this than me. Um, but, you know, we're on TikTok, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook. We also use Discord, for example. Um, so Newscast and Americast, we have like a Discord channel where people can ask us questions. Um, and so quite a lot of certainly the kind of social media presence that I have and, and the teams I work with at the BBC have is because of that interaction with the audience, not just getting the stories out there, but actually them asking us questions or giving us tips to investigate. Um, but we're not, 
we're, we're kind of not on any of those smaller platforms at, at the moment. OK. Um, and then uh, perhaps the two Chris's can pick up the next couple of questions. Uh, the gentleman at the back. Um, Bob Osherwood, University of Sheffield. Uh, thank you for a most interesting discussion. I wonder the question is what can broadcasters do to counter fake news? You've given us a lot of information this afternoon. Could the BBC and perhaps other public service broadcasters actually run a series of programmes indicating to people what they should look for when they're reading, listening and viewing? I don't think either of you actually technically represent a broadcaster. I, I, but what's I don't, your... but I, well, I, I mean, I can, I can speak to that. I think there are, there are two things which are, um, are worth considering. Number one is the importance of media literacy, as you say, and not just in school, but lifelong learning. Because I suspect most 17-year-olds probably know more about how to navigate through social media than their 65-year-old grandparents. So it's not, when we talk about media literacy, not just in schools. Yes, in schools, and we should take the example of places like Finland, that from the age of four makes people, makes kids really, really comfortable with operating in an online world, but also lifelong learning right through life so people don't feel this is something to fear and they feel that it can be a place where they can have a positive experience. So I think media literacy is really a really important part of it. Chris, we could... I, on that. I know, I think media literacy is hugely important, particularly to be taught in schools. I mean, <coughs> I, I, have, I have forwarded um, social media uh, video clips to my kids saying something's amazing, and they tell me immediately, no, that's clearly faked. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, they, they have it in their instinct. The trouble is, you, when you are fed this so much information, you, you, you just don't gather. There's just one thing I'd like to just add to this, which I think is, is really difficult for broadcasters and social platforms and regulators, is the issue of freedom of expression, mm. which is that you may not think this is relevant to misinformation and fact-checking. But there is a place where, and particularly, in, for instance, in economics, et cetera, where facts aren't so clear and opinions do come into account. And you know, the most obvious one that sort of, uh, sort of appears to me to be what people used to call fake news for years was the MMR scam by uh, the, the doctor who basically believed that it was giving you, uh, or, or, or children all sorts of, was giving you autism. Now, it turned out to be a total fabrication. But can you imagine that if his research was genuine, if it worked out, and he was correct. People would have been furious with shutting, shutting that person down. Now, I have absolutely no time for, for the autism MMR uh, vaccine scandal, but without examining these sometimes conspiracy theories or some of the scientific challenges, you, it's difficult to get to what is the truth, and sometimes the truth takes 10 years to get through, and you have yeah. to go through that process. Now, I'm really pleased you made that point, because the, there has to be a space somewhere for the unorthodox view. The question yeah, is how exactly... Because be sometimes, yes. very rarely, but sometimes the unorthodox view yeah. is or becomes the truth. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's One more question. Uh, at the back, right over there. Um, um, uh, S Sylvia Harvey, a trustee of the VLV. Um, it's an observation rather than a question. I hope that's all right. Yes. I don't know if people have noticed that... As long as you say at the end, do you agree? <laughs> no, 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 it's a question. Um, that Mark Thompson has gone recently from, I think, taking up a job with Ancestry.com, I think I got that right, to, in fact, taking up a job with... CNN. 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 President of CNN. And that seems to me to be an extremely interesting development and something that will be well worth watching, the outcome of that. Yeah, absolutely. OK, well, that's one short statement. So we have got time for one more question. Uh, gentleman over there. Oh, sorry, was there? Yeah. One at the back as well. OK, well, let's fit in two then. <laughs> Good. OK. Uh, would the panel agree that the watershed moment about fake news was not so much what happened in the 17th century, but when Tony Blair and the President of the United States misled two nations about the existence of weapons of mass destruction, which led to the Second Gulf War? Okay, would you have called that out if you'd been there at the time, Chris? Well, if, if we'd had the information at, at, at accurate at the time, yeah, we would. But I'm I, trying I, to remember, I, I, so, but, so basically they said, based on intelligent sources, so is that, a cop, is that the cop-out always? Or, well, I, I, I mean, what was Trump always? Trump's trick was never to say, I believe, it's people are saying that. So if, if, if you can keep citing these people who are saying these things, is, is that the get-out? It, it, well, it can be the get out, and obviously it was it was a, a, a very important moment. I think the difference now is just speed and scale. Yeah. Speed and scale, it's happening everywhere. And I think that, that's the difference. That was an important moment which obviously re reverberated through British politics for a very long time and American politics. But I think the difference now is that it's happening at scale and at a speed we haven't seen before. And I think, and I, I mentioned at the beginning um, in my opening remarks that in, in the next couple of years we should be prepared for most new information in the media to be generated 
by artificial intelligence. And one thing we shouldn't forget in this country is that the, most of that information will come from US monopolies based in California, some of it from Beijing. And for a country like ours, which has never been colonized, apart from if you maybe include the Normans, that's quite a troubling prospect because we are not in control of the information environment, which is going to have a massive impact on our society. Can I just... just I think that's a hell of a good thought to leave us hanging, but go on, Chris. Just very, very quickly. <laughs> but, but, to death. According to my definition of fake news, it is absolutely not fake news. What that was, was... Talk about the Blair thing. Yes, there yeah. was, was Blair allegedly telling a mistruth, and, the, uh, and whether or not the broadcasters and the journalists <laughs> call that out is a different thing. Yeah. But it's not fake news. Right. It's, it's a politician either believing a mistruth or telling a mistruth and the, and the broadcast is there to challenge it. Yeah. Okay, but we really must end. Uh, thank you very much to our panel. <laughs> <laughs>